Emotional Learning and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, or PTSD. This is Mark Gluck from Rutgers University, Newark. When events occur which put us or people we observe or know into danger, we form searing memories, memories laden with emotional content. Those memories can be useful because they help us avoid dangerous situations in the future. But sometimes the memories of these emotional events, these threatening events, can stay with us for years and years and interfere with our ability to function even in safe situations. Today I'm going to talk about the biological bases of emotion and fear and how this leads us to understand what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder. There'll be three parts to the talk, beginning by talking about some of the behavioral processes involved in fear learning, discuss their brain substrates, and then turn to talk about the clinical perspectives on PTSD. There are two types of uh, behavioral processes that are relevant to be aware of, autonomic arousal, or the fight or flight response, and conditioned fear, the way we study fear learning in a laboratory. The autonomic arousal, or the flight or fight response, is a collection of bodily responses, including decreased increased blood flow to muscles, increased respiration, and depressed digestion and immune function, that prepare the body to face threat. It involves both a number of increases, as noted blood pressure and heart rate go up, respiration, blood glucose level, pain suppression, perception and awareness, blood flow to large muscles in legs and arms. This is our body's way of preparing us to survive the next few minutes when we, our life and well-being is under attack or, or threatened. At the same time, other biological processes, which are not essential for surviving the next few minutes or surviving an immediate threat, are decreased because the body takes energy and resources away. So digestion, appetite, immune system is depressed, sexual arousal is decreased, touch sensitivity, peripheral vision, and even the body's growth all are depressed as the body focuses on survival. We study this kind of uh, emotional response, learning to predict danger in the laboratory, using a, a paradigm called conditional emotional response. And it occurs when a rat is given an unpleasant and surprising stimulus, such as an electric shock, it will typically display a short period of alert immobility. This freezing response can be seen in humans and gorillas, and it's innate. It's not something we learned. A conditioned emotional response is a classically conditioned response in which a physiological arousal is produced in response to a cue or a conditioned stimulus that has been paired with an emotion-evoking stimulus, like a shock. There are two ways this is studied in the laboratory. Um, so if we consider the situation where a tone and shock are paired, one thing we look at is the freezing behavior, so how long an animal freezes in seconds. You can see that the first time a tone is presented in, in figure A, that there's very little freezing that goes on. But after that tone has been paired with a shock, the freezing takes place for much longer. Another way to measure this fear response after a tone-shock pairing is to look at blood pressure. Um, we see in the right that after the first tone presentation, there's a little bit of an increase that we respond to any novel stimulus. But after that tone is paired with a shock, the tone itself causes a rapid change in blood pressure. So to summarize, there are two behavioral processes that we want to be uh, thinking about in this talk. Arousal, also called the fight or flight response, is the body's way of preparing to face or run away from a threat. Energy is diverted to the brains, lungs, and legs, and away from other systems, such as digestion and the immune system. Conditioned emotional learning is a form of conditioning in which a cue, such as a tone, is paired with an emotion-evoking outcome, such as a shock. This evokes a response, such as freezing or increased heart rate. Let's talk about the brain substrates underlying this fear learning and emotion. There are three brain regions that are important to be aware of. The amygdala, the hippocampus, and stress hormones, which are not a brain region so much as a brain system. So these are the key brain regions that we're going to talk about today. The frontal cortex a little bit, the hypothalamus and the thalamus less so. But the amygdala and the hippocampus are two brain regions that are critical. They're in the medial temporal lobe, and the amygdala sits right at the very end of the hippocampus, which is shown in blue. The amygdala is a collection of brain nuclei that lie at the anterior tip of each hippocampus. 
that is the front tip of the hippocampus. It's critical for learning and expressing emotional responses, as well as mediating the emotional formation of other memories. The amygdala is a collection of more than 10 separate subregions, each of which is called the nuclei, and all of which have different input and output pathways. Here's a broad overview of some of these key nuclei and how they interact. A sensory stimulus comes in, it goes through the thalamus, um, and from the thalamus it goes directly into the amygdala. This is often called the fast and rough pathway. But information from sensory information in the world will also go into the cortex, where it is processed and analyzed, um, and this creates a slower but more accurate description of what's going on. Information then goes into the basal lateral amygdala, from there to the central nucleus of the amygdala, and this leads to two sort of pathways for response, the ANS, or the arousal and stress hormone release, which we'll talk about later, as well as motor areas, which are responsible for the freezing or the startling. Let's take a look next at a video that'll tell us a little bit more about the amygdala. The amygdala is a collection of nuclei found in the temporal lobe. There are two amygdalae, one in each cerebral hemisphere. The term amygdala means almond, referring to one of the most prominent nuclei of the amygdala that has an almond-like shape. The major nuclei of the amygdala include the lateral nucleus, basal nucleus, accessory basal nucleus, central nucleus, medial nucleus, and cortical nucleus. Each of these nuclei can also be partitioned into subnuclei. One common scheme for anatomically organizing the amygdala is to divide it into a basolateral region made up of the lateral, basal, and accessory basal nuclei, and a cortico-medial region made up of the cortical, medial, and central nuclei. There are, however, other common ways of anatomically dividing the amygdala as well. The amygdala has traditionally been considered part of the limbic system, a group of structures linked to the processing of emotions. The amygdala has historically best been known for its role in processing fearful emotions. When a threatening stimulus is present in the environment, it is thought that the amygdala is also involved in identifying it as a threat and initiating a fight-or-flight response to it. More recent evidence, however, indicates that the amygdala is active during the processing of positive stimuli as well. Thus, it is now thought the amygdala's role is more complex than that of a threat detector. It may be involved with assigning positive or negative value to stimuli, and with a consolidation of memories that have a strong positive or negative emotional component. It is also still being explored in a variety of other behaviors, ranging from addiction to social interaction. Thus, its functions are diverse and still not fully understood. One of the leading researchers on the amygdala is Bruce McEwen at Rockefeller University. Next, we're going to hear from him some of his perspectives on this field. Starting with the amygdala, it is the... Uh, the brain area that's involved in fear, fear learning, also to some extent in aggression. It's also a brain structure that is involved in turning on the stress response, turning on the, the adrenaline, turning on the ACTH that causes cortisol secretion. It's also a, an area that's involved when you're, st when you're stressed in a see something dangerous like a snake walking in the in the woods you freeze and then you later move back uh, it's involved in all of these primary actions that are related to, to stress and, and self-defense we talked earlier about the fear conditioning that's used in laboratory studies um, of uh, emotional learning and we can see from physiological studies that record from the amygdala responses that look very much like the behaviors so look here, this is recordings from the basolateral amygdala in the kind of fear conditioning paradigm we described before to two odors, an almond odor shown in blue and an anise odor in yellow. At baseline, the amygdala, in a, this is in a rat, shows the same amount of responding to both. But after the almond odor, in, namely the blue, is paired with a shock, we see that presentation of the almond odor shows a response much like we saw behaviorally. The amygdala uh, neurons are firing at a much more rapid rate. This suggests that some learning about danger probably takes place in the basolateral amygdala where neural connections change as a result of experiencing a neutral CS paired with a fear-evoking US like a shock. The amygdala in expression 
and emotional responses. Amygdala activity can trigger both physiological arousal, that fight or flight response, as well as behavioral responses. Humans given amygdala stimulation may report subjective feelings of mild positive or negative emotion, but generally do not exhibit strong behavior or physiological responses, such as seen in cats and rabbits. Lesions of the central nucleus of the amygdala disrupt the ability to learn and display new emotional responses. In humans, Patients with bilateral damage to the amygdala often show deficits in learning emotional responses. The most well-known such patient, known by her initials SM, is introduced next. One of the most um, famous case studies in all of affective neuroscience. Um, she's a woman who is currently, I think, in her 40s. And um, as far as we can tell, the destruction of her amygdala has left her essentially fearless to at least external stimuli and um, to test whether SM is in fact fearless, the researchers who worked with her took her to a couple of um, the, the most frightening places that they could think of in the local area. So one was an exotic pet store and they offered her uh, exotic snakes to, to hold in the store even though she says she's afraid of snakes. Many people would hesitate to hold a snake right up to their face and touch its tongue and inspect its face really closely but SM had no problem doing that. Um, they also took her to a place that uh, is at least called the most haunted house in the United States, and they decorated it up for Halloween, and they have people, the staff, dressing up as monsters and things to try to scare people. And the researchers in SM went through with just a regular group, and all the other people who were in the group, as soon as they were in this haunted house, it was apparently very spooky, were you know huddling together, and they were really slow to go around corners, and SM was taking the lead and saying, come on, guys, follow me, and she would be the first around the corners, and when the monsters jumped out and tried to scare her, apparently she would scare them sometimes because she uh, had no fear response to them, which they were not expecting. And, um, and so what was really interesting about this is that SM is not emotionless. She, she experienced um, a lot of curiosity and excitement, which we think are governed by um, other regions of the brain predominantly. Um, but she just doesn't seem to have any normal anticipatory fear response. Um, but her, her lack of a fear response gets her in trouble. So she. Uh, apparently walks home in the evenings through sort of a vacant lot and she was mugged there at one point and I think at knife point and uh, most people when something scary like that happens to you and you are at risk of getting hurt you have a normal fear response when you're approaching that same place that would send you avoiding it I mean that's what the fear response is all about avoid things that might hurt you uh, and she doesn't have that response so she continues to take that same route home every night by herself you know. The next brain region of interest is the hippocampus. This is a brain region that we discussed in a previous lecture as being critically involved in forming new memories for facts and for events. Um, and now what we want to understand is what happens when those events that are being stored are events that are dangerous events or emotionally salient events. The hippocampus is critically involved in context learning. The hippocampus projects to the amygdala, both directly and indirectly, as we saw before, allowing contextual information from the hippocampus to help the amygdala trigger emotional responses. The ability of hippocampal contextual memory to influence emotional responding is part of the reason why returning to a location or context, such as HSM and that vacant lot, um, where an emotional experience occurred is often enough to evoke an emotional response. So place learning, where, where a danger occurred, where a threat occurred in someone with a normal brain system would show fear. Um, here we can see what happens when we compare someone with an amygdala lesion, like SM, which we just saw uh, a minute ago, with someone with a hippocampal lesion, like the patient HM, who was discussed in a previous, lesion, a previous lecture. So look here first at what happens in rats. So we're looking at a conditioned emotional responding um, from a rat's responding to a, a CS, like a tone. Controls will show, control rats will show a large amount of freezing, um, as you'd expect, to a, a cue that's been paired with a, a, a shock. Animals with an amygdala lesion show no fear, no freezing to the shock, but uh, an animal with a hippocampal lesion shows normal freezing. So, it's, so the graph on the left shows from the animal lesion studies that an amygdala lesion, but not a hippocampal lesion, will interrupt fear learning. We see the same pattern in humans, so that a, a normal human will show a fear response measured by SCR or stimulus conductance in the fingers, um, sort of an anxiety response. They'll show a normal response when a cue is paired with a shock. A patient like SM with an amygdala lesion will not show that fear 
as was described in the previous video, but a patient like HM with a hippocampal lesion will show normal. Now what we can do with humans, what we can't do with rats, is ask them about this learning experience, see what they remember from the training. And here's where we see something very unique about the humans that we don't, can't pull out of the rats. So the person with an amygdala lesion recalled the training. So like SM, who we saw in the previous video, she would recall the whole training where, say, a tone was paired with a shock. She could describe it. She could even tell you how many times the tone was paired with a shock. But every time she sees the tone, she shows no autonomic response, no, 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 no fear to it. On the other hand, a patient like HM, who has a hippocampal lesion, will have absolutely no recollection of the tone before. He won't, be, he won't even be aware that he was trained. But if you present the tone, his fear conditioning, his, his fear response is normal. So another way to understand the role of the hippocampus in context conditioning is the idea that this is somehow modulating or gating which cues are or are not appropriate to fear. So we know that we don't need a hippocampus for a rat to learn that a, a tone, as shown here, is paired with a shock. So you can take out the hippocampus and the rat learns that fine. What a rat with a hippocampal lesion has a hard time doing, however, is distinguishing between two contexts. So imagine an experiment in which there is a black box and a green box, and in both boxes a tone is played, but only in the black box is the tone followed by a shock. A rat with a, a normal rat, with an intact rat, will eventually learn to only show the fear response, the freezing, in the black box when it hears the tone, but eventually it learns that the tone in the green box means it's safe. This tells us that the hippocampus, but an animal without a hippocampus, an animal without a hippocampus, will show fear in both places. So it won't be able to learn that the green box is actually a safe context but only the black box. This tells us that the hippocampus is critical for tagging the context, such as the box, in terms of which cue in that context predicts an aversive outcome. The amygdala and the hippocampus and other brain regions are modulated by stress hormones that are activated during stressful situations. Stress hormones can strengthen memory and coding. The ANS signals the adrenal glands, which are located above the kidneys, to release stress hormones, including glucocorticoids and epinephrine, into the bloodstream. Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that is chemically related to epinephrine, but unlike epinephrine, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and affect fu brain function. Norepinephrine can indirectly promote strong learning in the cortex and hippocampus, but blocking or reducing norepinephrine can therefore reduce memory for emotional material. So this is some of the pathways by which the amygdala and stress hormones modulate memory storage in the hippocampus. You have the amygdala, which is activating the autonomic nervous system, the arousal and stress release. That triggers the adrenal glands to release adrenaline and glucocorticoids. Uh, the adrenaline affects the brainstem, which in turn further activates the amygdala. And from the, both the amygdala and directly from the adrenal glands, we see the hippocampus and the cortex being modulated. So these stress hormones are pervasive throughout the, throughout the brain, and during situations where one feels threatened, um, where one is in danger, these stress hormones can change the way that brain is functioning and memory is stored. Stress hormones can also impair recall. In addition to affecting memory and coding, stress hormones can affect retrieval. Whereas modest doses of stress hormones at the time of learning will improve new memory formation, a little bit of stress can uh, focus your attention and, and heighten your ability to encode new memories, the presence of stress hormones at recall will often impair the retrieval of older memories. This one way of thinking about this is that a little bit of stress of worrying about the exam may be good for while you're studying, when you're trying to encode new memories, but if you're stressed during taking the exam, when you have to recall it, that's likely to impair your performance in retrieval. So to summarize the brain substrates, emotion depends on many brain areas. The amygdala is central to fear and avoidance learning, and loss of amygdala impairs ability to learn fear associations. The amygdala also enhances storage of emotional memories by the hippocampus. So the facts and events that we had talked about in the previous lecture, the ways in which they are stored, the degree to which they are stored, are affected by amygdala activity, which is more active during fearful and stressful situations. Stress hormones can magnify memories formed during stress. And finally, the hippocampal region can modulate fear memories by providing a context for when they re are recalled, so that in certain 
context, spatial context or temporal context. Um, we know that uh, certain cues are associated with threat, but in other contexts, they're not. This brings us now to talk about really the central theme of this presentation, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. I'm going to talk first about the symptoms, then the neurobiological mechanisms that underlie these symptoms, and finally we'll discuss how PTSD is treated. Let's start by looking at a video that will tell us a little bit about understanding PTSD, picking up with the World Trade Center attack that uh, was introduced at the beginning of this lecture. You genuinely feel threatened by almost everything. It's a really isolating kind of condition. I was clenching my teeth so hard that I was chipping my fillings out. My muscles and my joints were always incredibly painful because I was tense the whole time, you know, waiting for, for something to happen, I guess. And obviously that's exhausting, kind of being on this high alert all the time. I've been a great supporter of the armed forces all my life. I've, I've done a lot of charity work um, for them. It was something that I had never considered that I could potentially get myself. But I almost felt like I wasn't worthy. Do you know, I, I haven't been to war. I haven't seen the horrific things that they've seen. So there's, you know, I, I can't have PTSD. I started getting panic attacks and having flashbacks. I couldn't understand how they'd be able to, to fix me, essentially. understanding how it physically would you know retrain my brain essentially and allow me to do the reprocessing it, it was a great comfort it allowed me to kind of see how things were going to get better People need to know that it, it is treatable. There's a lot of information out there that kind of talks about managing your PTSD or how to live with PTSD. And I think if people are unaware that you can completely be rid of it, um, obviously they're not really going to go down the correct routes to that treatment. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a psychological syndrome that can develop after exposure to a traumatic event, such as combat, rape, or natural disaster. There are four key categories of symptoms that you should be aware of. 
The first is re-experiencing, which are intrusive recollections of the trauma. And there are two basic types. There are daytime flashbacks that occur while someone is awake and, and, and during their daily life. And then there are flashbacks which come back as nightmares while sleeping. The second is avoidance of situations that are reminders of trauma, uh, a tendency to pull back from anything that might trigger a trauma memory. The third is emotional numbing, a sort of a lack of, of any kind of emotional responding, and persistent negative thoughts, so changes in mood. And four, arousal, the sort of this hyperarousal, and hypervigilance to threat, a tendency to perceive threat even when it might not even be there. And note that both nightmares and arousal contribute to one of the most pervasive and, and disruptive aspects of PTSD, which are sleep disorders. There are some very clear patterns of psychological recovery after a traumatic event. For most people exposed to trauma, the fear reactions subside with time, a phenomena termed resilience that you can see in the yellow line on the graph at the right. But for individuals with PTSD, the fear reactions persist for months or years, possibly reflecting a failure of extinction, that is, an inability to extinguish the ways in which various cues have become associated with the fear response. To get a, a clear understanding of some of these PTSD symptoms, we'll hear now from a director of one of the PTSD programs at Wild Cornell Medical College. Those common symptoms are the ones that are often most difficult to recognize, avoidance. It's human nature to avoid what's painful, right? So we avoid thinking about anything that's painful if we can. We avoid our emotions. We avoid going back to places that remind us of our trauma. But so that could be, and it may not be as obvious, um, because as trauma, uh, we think of it as uh, our, our memory for trauma as being cues to f becoming cues to fear. And so it may, be, and those generalize out from the specific event. So you could have been at the World Trade Center and perhaps not even been in the building but outside witnessing it. And then over time, you'll become afraid of tall buildings. So we had a patient who um, actually broke up with her, her fiance because he lived on the 30th floor of an apartment building and she was terrified to go into his building. Of course, she said that she was breaking up with him because they didn't get along and there are a whole host of other problems. The good news is that after treatment, she realized that she was just scared to go into his building and they got back together and they got married. But at the time, she had no, no recognition of it, that, um, that she was avoiding uh, his home because it reminded her of being at the World Trade Center. So you've heard from several therapists. Now I'm going to ask you to play therapist yourself to test your knowledge and understanding of PTSD and the symptoms. In each of the following movie clips, a person is shown who is suffering from PTSD, and that person exhibits one or more key symptoms for PTSD. After I show you each clip, I want you to identify the symptoms being displayed. And if you can do that, that'll show you that you've really begun to understand some of the symptomology of PTSD. The first clip is from the 2013 movie Iron Man 3. Tony. Tony. Do you know what Tony's symptoms are here? They're re-experiencing, and particularly re-experiencing in the form of nightmares. The next test question comes from the 1994 movie Forrest Gump. There are two characters in this scene, but only one of them is suffering from PTSD. What symptoms is he displaying? All the ice cream I could eat. And guess what? A good friend of mine was in the bed right next door. Lieutenant Dane, I got you some ice cream. Get it, Dad, ice cream. It's time for your bath, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Dan, who lost both his legs in the Vietnam War in the movie, what symptom is he displaying? <laughs> 
emotional numbing, despite the uh, social interaction and upbeat uh, uh, offering of ice cream from Forrest Gump, Lieutenant Dan shows absolutely no emotional responding. He's sort of, he's numb and his mood is flat. Let's look now at a more recent movie, 2003 Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. This is a more difficult one to identify what PTSD symptom is being illustrated in this movie. How do you pick up the threads of an old life? How do you go on when in your heart you begin to understand there is no going back? There are some things that time cannot mend, some hurts that go too deep, that have taken hold. So this is a little difficult one, but what we're seeing here is an example of avoidance a sense that certain uh, memories, certain experiences, certain places are so painful that they need to be avoided. One of the uh, best and uh, most complete characterizations of PTSD, really the theme of the entire movie was about a soldier returning from war with PTSD, was the 2014 movie American Sniper. So we've seen in this scene two symptoms of PTSD. Do you recognize them? The first is emotional numbing. As his children go by, as his wife comes in, he shows no emotional responding to them, much like Lieutenant Dan when he was uh, uh, being offered ice cream by Forrest Gump. But the other is re-experiencing as flashbacks. In contrast to the Iron Man movie where the re-experiencing was happening during sleep in the form of nightmares, here, for the main character, he's re-experiencing the sounds of the war while he's staring at a blank television screen. So this is, these are often referred to as flashbacks because they flash back during the, the daily life. There's another scene from American Sniper that shows a different symptom. Do you see if you can identify that here? So what just happened here? Kids were playing with the dog, and the dog started uh, playing and licking at one of the kids. But Chris perceived it as a threat and came out not only to sort of pull the dog off, but you saw he came just at the threshold of, of beating the dog, uh, something clearly sort of inappropriate in a situation where the kids and the dogs were just playing around. This is a, a, a symptom of hypervigilance, of perceiving a threat when it isn't there and responding as if one, as if oneself or one's loved ones are being threatened. So that's hypervigilance. So these are some of the symptoms. If you did got all or most of them correct, then uh, you probably have a good understanding now of what are the different symptoms that one sees in PTSD. And it's important to realize that not everyone shows all of these symptoms, but people who have PTSD have often have several of these symptoms. Some may be greater in some people than in others. Let's talk now about the neurobiology. Earlier we talked about the behavioral processes of fear and emotional learning, the brain substrates, the amygdala and the hippocampus especially. Now that we understand from the basic research about the biology of fear, learning, and emotion, what does that tell us about the neurobiological mechanisms that are being invoked in PTSD? Many neurobiological mechanisms appear to be disrupted in patients with PTSD. These include an overactive amygdala, an underactive hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, and disruptions in the level and timing of stress hormone release. Resilient individuals do not forget the trauma, 
nor the negative emotions that they experience with the trauma, but the cues are no longer able to evoke the conditioned fear response. The idea being that you don't want to forget a fearful or traumatic situation because our memories of these past trauma are what guide us to avoid them in the future in situations that could in fact be danger. PTSD occurs when these trauma memories both cause us to respond to threats when they aren't there and to be unable to remember the previous trauma experience without re-experiencing it in in an autonomic arousal fashion. Individuals with PTSD also fail to extinguish the normal fear response to stimuli that are associated with a traumatic event. The idea being that there may be some cues associated with the fear, um, which you form an association during the trauma, but later on if you see those cues and they're not associated with a traumatic situation, eventually you would extinguish the fear response to those cues. People with PTSD, they never extinguish that or they show very little extinguishing of cues that were previously associated with fear. So what does this tell us about predicting and preventing PTSD? Connections from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex are important in extinguishing learned associations. Individuals with a slightly smaller hippocampus might be less able to extinguish fear responses than their peers who have average hippocampal volumes. Remember the previous study we showed where rats um, without a hippocampus are unable to distinguish the context, the blue, the green box or the black box, where they should be afraid of the cue, the the tone cue. Amygdala hyperactivity may proceed and may actually confer risk for PTSD in individuals later exposed to a trauma. So if someone naturally or previously has a hyperactive amygdala, that can make them more susceptible to PTSD. Other risk factors for PTSD are still being studied, and they include certain genes, increased startle response to loud noises, and personality traits such as neuroticism, harm avoidance, and novelty avoidance. The next video is from the National Center for PTSD and was created to describe PTSD in the brain to people who may be suffering from this, primarily combat veterans. Today we're going to talk about the neurobiology of your post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll focus on several parts of your brain that we understand best. Here are the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. And for this, I will need a brave volunteer. Wonderful, come on up, Tony. The body includes an ancient stress response system. Tony, do you have any idea what that might be? Yeah, the fight, flight, or freeze thing, right? Precisely. Here, take a look at this marble machine. The body's fight, flight, or freeze stress response system is complicated, but I'll show you the most important stuff. Imagine that you've just confronted a life-threatening situation, which, shall we say, gets the marble moving. The response system kicks into high gear, and most often when the dangerous situation ends, the fight, flight, freeze response shuts off. Ding! (laughs) But with PTSD, your stress response system doesn't know when to quit. Tony, would you be comfortable sharing what PTSD is like for you? Well, I got back from Afghanistan about a year ago, but I'm still anxious or angry all the time. I don't sleep well. I'm, it's like I'm always on guard. So when Tony, or any of you for that matter, experienced your trauma, the amygdala, your brain's threat detector, set the stress response system into motion. Your body released adrenaline and other stress hormones, giving you that surge of energy that helped you respond to the threat. But my deployment was over a year ago. Yes, that's where the hippocampus comes in. It converts short-term to long-term memory, and it helps you remember where and when danger happens so that you can avoid it in the future. With PTSD, something could remind you of that trauma, and your hippocampus wrongly assumes that you're in that situation again. 
that sends a signal to your amygdala that it's time to go, go, go. And this happens over and over again. Eventually, in more and more situations, you can't deal with things like you used to. And it's hard to feel good about anything. So what can I do? First, you need to know that your brain is flexible. It can adapt. Your brain's prefrontal cortex is responsible for thinking, planning, decision-making, and shutting down the stress response. When you have PTSD and your amygdala is firing so much, it's hard to put the brakes on. With practice, you can bring your prefrontal cortex and amygdala back into balance. Evidence-based talk therapies can teach your mind and body to more effectively cope with stress. Talk therapy can strengthen your prefrontal cortex to help you stop the stress response system from going into overdrive. Certain medications can help you manage PTSD symptoms too. You have options. The best thing to do is to talk with your provider about the best plan for you. Finally, check out the National Center for PTSD at www.ptsd.va.gov. They have so many resources for you. Videos, brochures, mobile apps. Thanks. I'll check it out. If you feel you may be experiencing PTSD, talk with your health care provider. And be sure to go to the National Center at www.ptsd.va.gov today to learn more. So we've seen now that there are three brain regions that are critically involved. The prefrontal cortex, which is involved in modulating the activity in the hippocampus and, and the amygdala um, and deciding what, how to respond or when to respond the amygdala, which is the actual fear detection and fear encoding circuit, and the hippocampus, which is involved in understanding the, the context, both the temporal context, when fear is occurring, and the spatial context, where it is. Let's look a little bit more closely at some fascinating study that was done on hippocampal volume and PTSD risk. So this was a study that was done with twins who had gone, one of whom had gone to be in the Vietnam War. So there was a registry of brothers one brother, they were identical twins, one went to war, and uh, some of whom developed PTSD and others didn't, but the other twins all stayed back stateside, none of whom eventually developed PTSD. Now what they found was fascinating was that of those who developed, of the veterans who had been in war, um, those who had PTSD had a smaller hippocampus than those who did not develop PTSD. And that was consistent with many other studies, both in animals and humans, which suggested that a larger hippocampus um, was seen in those who uh, did not have PTSD. But it always had been the open question of, does this a pre-existing condition? Um, is a small hippocampus put you at risk for it, for PTSD? Or is a small hippocampus the consequence of PTSD? Namely, does being having PTSD, does all the stress responses, the continual stress, is that shrinking the hippocampus? And what this study showed is it argued that the hippocampus was probably a pre, small hippocampus was probably a pre-existing condition because the unexposed twins of the veterans who developed PTSD had a smaller hippocampus than the unexposed twins of the veterans who did not. Now, none of those unexposed twins had PTSD, so PTSD didn't cause the small hippocampus, and we assume, therefore, that by looking at the unexposed twin, the twin who didn't go to war, um, that we see something about what their hippocampus was like before they developed PTSD. And so this suggests that a small hippocampus may be a pre-existing risk factor for PTSD, but that PTSD occurs only if they're exposed to trauma. So there's the combination of the pre-existing condition, the small hippocampus, and the exposure to trauma, suggesting that those with a small hippocampus may experience trauma in such a way that they're unable to develop an appropriate context for it. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So just to review the data from this, this critical study, so pre-existing vulnerability factors help determine an individual's risk for PTSD, and hippocampal volume may be a factor. What we see on the right, which was illustrated in the figure um, that we saw previously, is the hippocampal volume. Um, so the veterans with PTSD and the veterans with no PTSD, those with no PTSD, had a larger hippocampus. 
did the PTSD cause the small uh, hippocampus in those with PTSD? Probably not, because if you look at their twin brothers, the twin brothers of those with PTSD had a small hippocampus as well. So how do we interpret this? Why is this small hippocampus as a pre-existing condition uh, making, putting people at risk for having PTSD? Well, remember this study before that we described earlier, that rats don't need a hippocampus to learn that a tone predicts a shock, but they do need a hippocampus to learn that a tone in a black box predicts shock, but a tone in a green box does not. And rats without a hippocampus wind up responding to the tone as, as a fearful stimulus in both the black box, where it is, in fact, predictive of shock, as well as in the green box, which is actually a safe context. The rats without a hippocampus are, in effect, over-responding to fear or, or expecting fear or expecting a shock that never occurs. We can think of this, in this case, as a form of overgeneralization, so that the rats fail to learn the very specific spatial and temporal context in which the, uh, the cue is a trigger or a predictor of a, uh, a, th a threatening event, in this case a shock. And the same thing can be seen as a way of thinking about what's happening in PTSD. So a soldier who hears a loud noise last year in Afghanistan, that's probably a threat. That could be incoming mortar fire or, or uh, 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 an attack of some sort. And you, show, you should show fight or flight response. You should drop to the ground. You should return fire. You should do all the things that are appropriate if you're under attack in a military theater. On the other hand, that same loud noise a year later, a different time, a different place, there shown in Washington, D.C., probably is not incoming mortar fire or machine gun, but rather a car backfiring or something else. So what we see in people with PTSD is they, they act an awful lot like the rat in the green box. Namely, they are responding to expect a threat uh, for the rat a shock, for the soldier uh, incoming fire, in a context where they should otherwise have appropriately learned is safe. And loud noises don't predict uh, incoming fire uh, or, or mortar attacks or so forth when you're in a safe civilian context outside the war. So this shows a way in which we can relate the symptomology of PTSD as being a form of hippocampal impaired overgeneralization that we see as well in rats that are experiencing fear conditioning in different contexts. So we've seen about uh, an overview of some of the symptoms of PTSD, a discussion of how the, the neurobiological mechanisms of PTSD um, are hijacking or disrupting or created by uh, disturbances in the frontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. But what do we do about it? How can we treat PTSD? So there are, at this point, a number of different ways of treating PTSD. And there are four videos which I'm going to show you next. The first two described fairly standard treatments that are widely in use today, while the second two are really about future directions, more experimental approaches for future ways of treating PTSD. It's important to note that even for the current therapies um, that are described, they only work some of the time for some people. And this tells us that we still have a lot more research to do about how to both understand PTSD and how to best treat it. If you have post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, it's common to feel like there are places or situations that are unsafe. It may seem like the best option is to avoid them, staying away from people or places that feel dangerous or reminders of a traumatic event. As a result, you may develop I can't rules. I can't leave the house at night. I can't trust anyone. I can't handle crowds. But these rules won't help you overcome PTSD. So how do you learn to say I can Prolonged exposure, or PE, is a treatment for PTSD that helps you do safe things you've been avoiding. In PE, you and your therapist will practice exposure, meaning you'll work to approach things you've steered clear of since the event. You have to challenge your I can't rules to prove to yourself that you can. Remember when you were learning to swim or even drive a car? It was challenging at first, but got easier with practice. Exposure gets easier with time. With your therapist, you'll take steps to do the things that have been hard for you at your own pace. So if you're avoiding the grocery store, you might start by going when it isn't crowded, maybe bringing a family member along. You'll eventually practice going on your own, perhaps even during peak hours. With practice, you'll find that you can handle it. You'll also talk through the details of your traumatic event in a safe, gradual way with your therapist. Closing your eyes can help you concentrate. 
Retelling the event may sound like the last thing you want to do, but it helps with emotions like anger, guilt, and sadness. You'll listen to a recorded version at home too. After a few months, you'll find that you can talk about your trauma without feeling so overwhelmed. Prolonged exposure doesn't erase your trauma, but it can help you keep your traumatic experience from getting in the way of living your life. PE doesn't require you to take any medications. With your therapist's help, you'll follow a step-by-step -step program for about three months. Most people who complete PE show noticeable improvement in their symptoms, and many no longer have PTSD. Prolonged exposure works well for both men and women, and it's evidence-based, which means PE has been proven to work in multiple research studies. If prolonged exposure sounds like it could be right for you, talk to your doctor about finding a PE provider or visit the National Center for PTSD website at www.ptsd.va.gov to learn more about PE and other PTSD treatment options. No matter how long you've been living with PTSD, know that you can get better. So prolonged exposure therapy is a form of conditioning, at least the, you're exposing people to the stimuli that trigger the trauma, and what you're effectively trying to do is extinguish them, much like a rat might be shown after it had learned that tone predicts shock, it might be shown the tone alone many times, or something similar to the tone, and eventually training it. So prolonged exposure therapy is essentially is a way of altering the habits, the, the pathways, the response pathways in the brain. But it doesn't really tap into our our cognitive awareness. There's another therapy called cognitive processing therapy that takes a different approach to PTSD that tries to create a broader cognitive uh, awareness of what's happening so that you can modulate your response. A traumatic event can change the way you think about yourself and the world. You might think you're to blame for what happened or believe you don't deserve to be happy. You may start to believe the world is unsafe. Doing things like going to a grocery store or restaurant may seem too dangerous. These kinds of thoughts are common in people with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. They're called stuck points. They keep you stuck in your PTSD and cause you to miss out on the people, places, or activities you used to enjoy. So how do you get unstuck? Cognitive processing therapy, or CPT, is a PTSD treatment that can help you break the negative thinking that's holding you back. It's based on the idea that our thoughts affect how we feel and how we act. In CPT, you and your therapist will talk about how your negative thoughts about the trauma, those stuck points, have changed you, how safe and in control you feel, how much you trust yourself and others, and even your sense of self-worth. You'll practice a strategy to change or challenge your stuck points. PTSD can make you jump to negative conclusions, but there may be other ways to think about things that are more accurate and less upsetting. Imagine you're driving down the highway and someone swerves in front of you. You might blow up at the driver. What a jerk. But what if he was racing to the hospital or having a panic attack and rushing to get off the road? If you consider these possibilities, you might not feel as angry. The bottom line, small changes in thinking can have a big impact on how you feel. Some people find that writing about their trauma helps them change upsetting thoughts and feelings. You and your therapist can decide whether or not this is right for you. CPT works just as well either way. You can also choose to meet with your therapist one-on-one -on -one or in a group with others who have PTSD. CPT is evidence-based, meaning it's been shown to work in multiple research studies. And it doesn't take years. In fact, CPT usually takes about three months of weekly visits. CPT can help you get unstuck, freeing you up to start enjoying the things you've been missing out on. Men and women, veterans and civilians can all benefit from CPT. If cognitive processing therapy sounds like it could be right for you, talk to your doctor about finding a CPT provider, or visit the National Center for PTSD website at www.ptsd.va.gov to learn more about CPT and other PTSD treatments. No matter how long you've been living with PTSD, know that you can get better. So these two therapies, cognitive processing therapy and exposure therapy, are probably the predominant ways in which PTSD are treated today. Both have evidence supporting them working to some degree in, in a number of people. Now you might ask, well, which is better, CPT or exposure therapy? And the answer is we don't really know, and we also don't know why CPT may work for some people, 
um, but not others, and, and why for an individual with PTSD, we don't know which approach, CPT or exposure therapy, is likely to be more to work for them. So there's clearly a lot of work to, to, to be done on therapies for PTSD. And the next two slides describe two of the future directions where PTSD clinical research is going, attempting to develop better and more personalized approaches. The first involves an interview with Joe Ledoux from the New York University, who's one of the experts on fear learning and fear memory and on the reconsolidation of fear, what happens when we recall a memory and how do we go back and re -re restore an old memory. It's called reconsolidation. Well, Here's memories Joe stored in our minds, memories most of us are able to come to terms with. But for some people, the trauma of experiencing danger, violence, or panic can create a debilitating disorder. What if fear memories could be rewritten? All of this research was based on systemic manipulations of the brain. Dr. Joseph Ledoux is a professor of science at New York University and serves as principal director for the NIMH-funded Center for the Neuroscience of Fear and Anxiety. He's part of a team that has found a way to block fear memories through a process called reconsolidation. During a recent visit to the NIMH campus in Bethesda, Dr. Ledoux explained the key to reconsolidation is understanding how memories are formed in the first place. Each time you form a memory, uh, your brain begins to form that memory in a temporary way that can be uh, interfered with. Um, if nothing else happens. So you have to convert a temporary memory into a long-term memory in order to have that memory at some time in the future. In 1999, a study from the Ledoux team showed the ability to block the consolidation of fear memories by injecting protein synthesis inhibitors to stop growth of certain cells in the amygdala, the brain's fear hub. So that led Kareem Nader, who was in my lab at the time, to say, well, can we do the same thing with reconsolidation? which means instead of giving the protein synthesis inhibitor after learning and blocking consolidation, you give it after the retrieval of a previously consolidated memory. So you form the memory, you, the animal now has a long-term memory, and then at some point after that memory is fully established, you give the rat the tone, which retrieves the memory, and then you give a protein synthesis inhibitor, and then you test the animal the next day, and the memory is no longer there. It's like a person who um, goes to trial to testify about a crime, and instead of uh, testifying about what they witnessed on that day, they testify about what they read in the newspaper. Because each time you take a memory out, as the newspaper reading did, you restore it, and the information gets stored as a new memory. So the bottom line of all this research is your memory is only as good as your last memory. Perhaps the greatest potential for a therapeutic application is with post-traumatic stress disorder patients. Where a patient with intrusive memories um, could be, through the aid of a, a therapist and the aid of the proper manipulation, such as a drug that's safe to use with humans, the patient could be encouraged to retrieve the traumatic memory, given the manipulation, and presumably the uh, memory will be weakened at a later point. In December, a new study was published in Nature from a larger NYU research team that showed a drug-free method of replacing fear memories in people using exposure training. Dr. Ledoux acknowledges ethical questions when it comes to the science of altering memories. I understand why people worry about that because memories are treated as sacrosanct. They are, you know, we are our memories in many ways. We have to remember who we are to be that person from day to day. But one thing we have to realize is just how much we manipulate memory as part of life. Um, you know, every time we uh, watch an ad for a product, our memory is being manipulated. Every time a student goes to class, his or her memory is being manipulated. Every time you have a social interaction with a person, you're trying to create a good impression, which is basically a memory. And once we put it into that context, the idea that you might use memory manipulation to help people uh, maybe doesn't seem so malevolent. So we've seen here in the last three videos, they all talk about 
uh, a com- there's a common theme, the idea that one is bringing back the memories. In the exposure therapy, they're being re-exposed to talking about their therapy. In the cognitive processing therapy, there was also the component of writing about and talking about the memories, bringing them back, and somehow learning to use those memories, learning to reorganize them or restore them, reconsolidate them, as, as Joe Ledoux referred to it, in a way that's not quite as disruptive. Um, and the, the, the work from... Uh, Joe Ledoux and, and Kareem Nader, who was described here, suggest that in addition to the exposure therapies, in addition to the cognitive behavioral therapy, there may actually be pharmacological interventions that can assist in reconsolidating memories in a way, fear memories in a way that they no longer disrupt our lives. There's a, a totally different approach to PTSD that involves neurosurgery rather than therapy or drugs. Um, and that is brain stimulation. Brain stimulation is a growing area of treatment for neurological and psychiatric disorders. It's commonplace now for Parkinson's disease. It's increasingly being used for psychiatric disorders, such as uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder. But here are some studies that are looking at the possibility that brain stimulation, brain implants through surgery, could also be effective for PTSD. How are you doing? It's a simple conversation under the most complex of circumstances during brain surgery. Serena Kelly is the first patient in Canada to receive a procedure known as deep brain stimulation for treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Sunnybrook surgeons, guided by her brain images, have inserted two electrodes deep into her brain, targeting the precise areas causing her PTSD. Serena? Feel anything there? By talking her through a series of questions, they make sure they've hit their target. These electrodes will eventually be controlled by this pacemaker-like device. It will be implanted during the second part of the surgery and will send ongoing electrical stimulation to the affected parts of her brain, hopefully easing her symptoms. For decades, Serena has lived with the dark and debilitating effects of PTSD. She says she has survived multiple sexual assaults, an abusive long-term relationship, and most recently, the loss of her daughter Harley in a motorcycle collision. So that was very traumatic and has caused a lot of, um, a lot of very intense um, symptoms. Living with PTSD I feel is like being in a prison almost. I can't do the things that I want to do. I don't have a life. Other treatments offered no relief, but that's where deep brain stimulation comes in, says Dr. Nir Lipsman. He's the principal investigator of a new Sunnybrook-led study looking at the safety of deep brain stimulation for patients like Serena. Over the last 20 years or so, we've been learning much more about psychiatric conditions, things like depression and obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And we're starting to realize that those uh, symptoms of those conditions are driven by circuits in the brain that we can access with these electrons. It's estimated more than 3 million Canadians are currently living with PTSD, a crippling mental illness that can occur after abuse, disasters, accidents or military combat. Approximately one-third are treatment-resistant, meaning possible new options, like deep brain stimulation, are critically needed. Dr. Lipsman says it will likely take months to gauge how the treatment is working. This first phase of the study will include an additional four patients who will be followed for one year. With eight grandchildren and three surviving children, Serena says she wants to be there for them. I hope that at least the bigger symptoms go away. I do hope this does work, not just for me, but for for others to give them hope. With Sunnyview, I'm Monica Mattis. So that brings us to the end of the clinical perspectives. Let's summarize what we've learned. PTSD can develop in some people after exposure to a traumatic event. Key symptoms include re-experiencing, avoidance, emotional numbing, and hypervigilance. Many brain systems are disrupted in PTSD, including an overactive amygdala, an underactive or small hippocampus, and underactive frontal cortex.
There are also disruptions to the level and timing of stress hormones, which modulate the function of these brain regions. Prior risk factors include genetics and some personality traits. And six, the most common current treatments for PTSD include prolonged exposure therapy, or PE, and cognitive processing therapy, or CPT. Experimental treatments still underway being studied include replacing or reconsolidating fear memories with pharmacological interventions, as described by Joe Ledoux, as well as new approaches to brain stimulation. As we come to the end of this lecture, let me review what are the learning objectives, what I hope you learned, and what you'll be responsible for when we come to the exam. The first is to describe the physiology and behaviors associated with the fight-or-flight response, to understand fear learning and how it is measured, to identify the major brain regions involved in fear and emotion learning and how they interact, to characterize the role of stress hormones in fear and arousal, and for PTSD to understand the major symptoms, the primary risk factors, and both current and experimental treatments. For those of you who are students at Rutgers University Newark, you may also be interested in getting involved in PTSD research. In my lab, we study PTSD in women survivors of sexual violence. If you are a woman interested in PTSD and would like to join the research team, please contact me at my email that was given in the first slide. So I'd like to thank you all for joining me for this lecture. Are you worried about the exam? If so, remember what FDR said. unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat 